Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome again uh, to one of our interesting sessions during the 29th International Conference of Management of Technology. Today is day three. Um, good afternoon, good morning, uh, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, so I'd like to enjoy our talk with you today. Uh, today you are really delighted to have Jeff uh, uh, Betts from IBM. I will leave the floor to Professor Khalil, uh, Chair of the IMO 2020 Conference, to introduce our uh, uh, distinguished speaker. Dr. Khalil, floor is yours. Thank you, thank you Nezad, and uh, thank you everybody for joining us from wherever you are around the world. Uh, we are delighted to have you with us uh, for this important occasion. And uh, this afternoon we have uh, a very interesting keynote uh, presentation by Jeff Bates uh, of IBM. Jeff actually is the global industry CTO uh, for industrial market sales for data, AI, um, machine learning, deep learning, and data science. Uh, and uh, 26 years uh, for software solutions. Uh, in consulting for industrial, manufacturing, uh, and all areas uh, of marketing. Uh, Jeff actually started leveraging analytics uh, with uh, his customers in 1997. So you can see it's very pertinent to uh, the topics that we are discussing in this conference. He was an account executive uh, for Cognos Consulting Service Partners, and uh, he uh, worked uh, with Cognos for the benefit of his customer base. Also, he deployed and integrated analytics with customers, leveraging the GDE ERP platform. Uh, analytics became uh, very relevant in other service lines and uh, e-commerce, uh, customer application development, asset management, uh, service desk software deployment, and many other areas in here. Uh, and Jeff has worked extensively with several uh, of the partners, uh, including uh, partnership with Microsoft Corporation uh, in uh, February uh, 2012, actually, Jeff joined Dell Software Group uh, as a software global account manager responsible for sales and marketing of the entire uh, Dell Software portfolio. Uh, since joining IBM in 2016, uh, he held several positions as uh, open source analytics, uh, evangelist uh, named account manager uh, and analytics portfolio sales leader assigned to Toyota, Lexus, Ford, Ford Motor, uh, FCA, Aptiv, Delphi Technologies, Boeing, Honda, you name it, from the big names of companies in the USA and globally in here. In April 2020, IBM promoted Jeff to the position of industry CTO for industrial market. And he is focused on automotive, manufacturing, oil and gas, uh, mining. Jeff is a native of uh, Detroit, Michigan, and he lives there with uh, his wife and two kids. And uh, we welcome uh, Jeff with us from Detroit, Michigan. Uh, Jeff, thank you for being here, and the floor is yours. Thank you for that nice introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Jeff Bates, industry CTO from IBM, again, focused on our industrial market. Today, what I thought I would do is focus our, our topic of conversation around leveraging artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, regarding drilling. <clears throat> Today I'll speak for probably 10 minutes on some research that I've conducted around some best practices uh, and knowledge sharing around this topic, uh, specifically 
not only drilling, but where to drill. According to a markets and markets report, the artificial intelligence and machine learning market for the oil and gas business is predicted to be worth north of almost $3 billion over the next three years. And this pertains specifically to the predicted spend and investment made by companies in this vertical market. When IBM looks at our industrial market, it consists of high-tech manufacturing, automotive, aerospace. It also consists of our mining business, our chemicals business, and most relevant today towards my speech around our oil and gas business. Oil and gas is a vertical market that we manage <clears throat> extensively and globally at IBM. And there are so many topics to choose from. However, I wanted to focus this presentation today on how to pick the perfect spot to drill uh, for our petroleum and uh, oil and gas customers, leveraging what we call industry 4.0 technologies and solutions. As we all know, the petroleum industry is in a major state of disruption due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And mistakes cannot happen that will only put more pressure on an industry that's under an immense amount of financial pressure, especially here in the United States. Focus on digital transformation must be the top priority for our oil and gas clients to reduce risk while improving operational efficiency in the process of making conservative, confident capital decisions. To quote the IEA oil market report, the oil world has seen many shocks over the years, but none has hit the industry with quite the ferocity that we're witnessing today. One of the toughest problems oil and gas companies must manage is where to drill. Volumes of data, accounts, real-time updates, geoscience, geophysical reports, petroleum, engineer insights, and other sources all exist. And unless a petroleum company has a true cognitive computing approach, much of this data is sitting in unstructured data silos, making it difficult to research, compile, and to develop and recognize trends to make confident decisions regarding where to drill. The location to start drilling is of course underground or underwater, and the truth is in the previously mentioned data. Some of these drilling spots can be worth more than a billion dollars or more to a company and its employees. And those decisions, if they're not made correctly, can affect one's job or even the survival of the entire company. And the solution or answer to discovering the perfect spot to, to start drilling resides in the data. So big data is everywhere. Historical operational data, data in silos, IOT, real-time sensor data at the well or at the field, it all can be part <clears throat> of what we call a company's digital transformation, digital maturity path, or beating your competition. Enabling a cognitive mature approach allows AI, robotics, blockchain, IoT analytics and digital twin technology to be incorporated into one consolidated and mineable repository to make better and correct business decisions. So past failures data, past successes data, gathering data from different sources and domains, they're all part of a Nirvana-based cognitive solution that learns over time and never stops learning. It learns and enables petroleum companies to make one and done confident decisions. So how do you get started? First, we believe an investment must be made in the infrastructure of the discussed cognitive approach. It must be business driven with most importantly, executive sponsorship. On-premise hybrid cloud, 100% outsource cloud solutions exist from the top technology providers and are readily available. So that's first. Second, understand that AI is a journey, it's not a destination, and that planning at every stage is critical. And third, interview, assess, and pick a solid business partner. Historically, oil and gas companies have older legacy systems that manage their businesses and operate in silos. And an agile approach is recommended to be able to pivot and pivot faster with readiness from a business change and technology change perspective. Cognitive solutions allow companies to find 
the path in their data. Software exists now that picks up and learns corporate jargon, understands questions and requests, natural human language, and slang without any coding. Processes can be learned, and with cognitive software solutions, it continues to learn and never, ever stops learning. Uncovering optimization opportunities, path, paths within your data, and defining options and ways forward that are confident and correct for our drilling cu customers. Answers can provide immediate impact as the value proposition. So businesses that keep pace and op operationalize their data will win regardless of the market or industry vertical that they're in. And because of the current petroleum surplus and pricing freefall due to the COVID-19 pandemic, costly mistakes regarding where to start drilling just simply cannot happen. Petroleum executives must implement and adapt digital and cognitive transformation solutions to protect the business that employs them and allows the company to maintain its relevance and stature in this industry. Extracting oil and the related insights is where the cognitive and machine learning tools come into play. Driving business efficiencies, business performance, and positive financial results aiding your employees, stockholders, and consumers. Machine learning allows computers to learn and interpret the data without having humans involved to interpret that same data. Human operators make mistakes. And with machine learning and AI software solutions allowing petroleum companies to respond faster to concerns not detected by humans in the same process. New connections and insights are quickly returned to the business leveraging these technologies. To quote per Harold Congelf, Acker BP Improvement Senior Vice President, the oil and gas industry is facing a rapidly changing digital landscape that requires cutting edge technologies to cultivate growth and success. Regarding the future of AI, IBM Senior Manager Brian Goucher recently said, cognitive environments and technologies can bring decision makers together, help them seamlessly share insights, bring in heterogeneous data sets more fluidly, and enable target analysis and simulation. Machine learning and AI solutions allow computers to assess large volumes of disparate data and make appropriate decisions to solve to solve complex problems, like how the human brain functions and solves problems. AI and ML programs are designed to never tire, continuously evolve, and get better and improve as new information and data is ingested. As a result, AI and ML solutions allow for more effective forecasting, again, without any coding or dependence on IT or data scientist resources that are usually busy and overburdened on other critical projects. One solution from my employer, IBM, allows for all this to happen for the oil and gas industry. IBM Exploration Decision Advisor is a cognitive computing platform that allows petroleum exploration businesses <clears throat> to find the ability to, or to have the ability to find the right location regarding drilling and much faster. This cognitive solution from IBM leveraging machine learning gathers data from different sources and disciplines, and it analyzes and ranks the data, allowing for the best drill decision to be made. Evidence-based analysis is core to the equation, again, with no coding or any dependence on your IT or data scientist teams. In the last five to six months, many industries, including oil and gas, have required dramatic changes to be made to their businesses, to their operations, and capital reserves. Leveraging available, Cognitive software solutions to prevent error is a must in today's surplus situation and to respond to a bullwhip supply chain scenario when a vaccine is found and applied to the public. AI can help petroleum exploration and production focused companies overcome historical constraints and to increase profits concerning drilling. It has been my pleasure to provide the IAMOT with this presentation today, and I wanted to extend my thanks once again for having me and for allowing IBM to present this, this concept in this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, appreciate it very much. Uh,
I'm sure we have a number, a large number of questions for you because your background and areas of work are quite interesting to us and to the topics that uh, we are discussing uh, during this conference. So uh, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions and we'll allow other people uh, to ask questions from the audience, if uh, you don't mind. Nizad, maybe you can collect questions or, or you can uh, uh, start uh, uh, allowing people to ask uh, questions. I have a couple of uh, quick questions, Jeff, because of your background. Uh, uh, the, f the first thing is uh, you have uh, worked uh, very much in, uh, in leveraging uh, a number of uh, analytics and other uh, uh, techniques and technologies in industry. Uh, could you tell us how, uh, how can some of the companies that are not leveraging analytics can take advantage of this? Yes. So as far as analytics is concerned, it's um, probably one of the biggest areas that we're seeing as far as corporate budgets are concerned. Without analytics, it's extremely difficult to pull or derive insights as far as your, your business, business continuity, how your partners work with, with your companies and so forth. What we're finding is companies, especially larger companies, either have one or two approaches. They have an open source or lack of standards approach, or we're finding that some of our clients are adapting more of a standardization approach. So imagine a, a painter having a palette that has seven or eight different colors. That's where I would consider to be, you know, a situation where there aren't, you know, standards in, in place in terms of analytics. And then some of our clients are, are finding out that this is just not working because there's just too many choices from a software perspective on how to, how to run the business. So my suggestion is always a standards approach. Um, but also one that would allow for the acceptance of a number of open source technologies that universities like Nile are teaching their students when they come out of college. Which brings the issue because some people might not be quite aware of, uh, of the uh, techniques in here. When you're talking about open source and leveraging it, particularly, for example, in the automotive industry, I, and you have done it for the big ones like Toyota and Ford and uh, and Boeing and Honda and so on. I mean, uh, how the, how does that actually how how could a, a company that is has not been into this uh, do it? Yeah, again, I think like we talked about earlier regarding where to drill from a petroleum perspective. I think it comes down to executive sponsorship making sure the company truly has what we would call a chief data officer or a VP of data or analytics, making sure that those resources are in place, making sure boards of directors of these companies understand the priorities and the budgets that are required. Um, it's not just people, it's infrastructure, it's software, it's resources, it's business partners, it's companies like IBM and so forth. So I, I think if you don't have an analytics strategy, I don't know how you're going to win. That's exactly what we're talking about. And this is exactly why we're bringing it here. Because, you know, uh, we, we, we are uh, an organization that have uh, uh, sort of uh, members from all over the world and uh, many members also from uh, the Middle East and Africa and uh, some of the developing nations and so on. And the concepts that you are talking about in terms of AI and analytics and so on have not been applied heavily. I mean, you're talking about maybe industries that are sophisticated, uh, that have that background, uh, that uh, they have the resources and the know-how of it. But if, uh, if uh, some of those uh, less uh, capable or the less uh, equipped uh, corporations, uh, how, how would they go? Would they just go and get a consultant to do it? Well, what we're seeing in the United States, also in the Middle East and different parts of the world, are new industry, but also university consortium partnerships that are being created. So if you look at what's going on with um, 
the Army Corps of Engineers here in the United States, also with NASA. They're partnering, I believe, with the University of Mississippi to further build what we would call a National Center of Artificial Intelligence here in the United States. We're also being asked to assist with respect to the development of the Saudi National Center of Artificial Intelligence in partnership with um, with uh, King Fahd University. So there's a number, <clears throat> or excuse me, King Saud University. So there's a number of university partnerships that we're seeing that are maturing very nicely, but also an opportunity for those university partnerships with IBM to bring in companies, to bring in commercial organizations that are looking to learn more about how to partner effectively. So it's a triangle. It's it's, it's the university, it's companies like IBM, and then it's the corporations that all work together to build out these AI center of excellences. Excellent. Uh, okay, I'm going to... Nizar, are you there? Uh, okay, let's see if we can get uh, questions from the... Um, um, please, uh, uh, if you have any question, we can use the function of raising hand. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Anton Bota, floor is yours. Please go ahead with the question. Thank you, Nazar. Jeff, thank you for a very interesting uh, presentation. Um, I was thinking about, you know, you talk about data, data being in silos, uh, data being available through analytics and AI to solve some of these problems. I remember speaking to uh, Dave Snowden many years ago when he was still at, at IBM, and we were talking about the, the wisdom aspect, the experience aspect of solving problems. Uh, he said they were put down on a rig in the, uh, in the North Sea uh, by an helicopter. It was a very stormy sea. There was a problem with the rig and nobody knew what it was. So this guy was flown out and Jeff, uh, sorry, and, uh, and Dave went with him to, to try and learn about their methodologies. And as their feet touched the platform, this guy told Dave, I know what the problem is. And Dave said to him, but you haven't even looked at, uh, you haven't spoken to anybody, you haven't looked at the data. He says, no, I feel it in the reek. So that feel it in the reek, you know, that that human wisdom experience. How do we bring that and data together to get most benefit out of this? Sure. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of this um, <clears throat> regarding some of our customers like Qatar Gas and Qatar Petroleum, for example, out in the Middle East, where we're dealing with use cases around um, things like stuck pipe. We're, we're dealing with our use cases specifically in the automotive industry that allow for predictive maintenance or what we would call visual inspection. Um, I think it comes down to the maturity path when it comes to IoT devices, when it comes to sensors that can mirror that human feel, like you feel it in your gut, you feel it in your fingers, you feel it in your feet or whatever your example was. I think that's where we're going with a lot of the IoT related sensor uh, solutions that can provide streaming data allowing for us to make better business decisions for our clients. Uh, we're starting to see this with some of the um, wearable devices that we're, that we're seeing today, um, not only on the plant floor, but also in a number of our manufacturing facilities. Uh, we're starting to see this as well with um, some of our predictive uh, solutions regarding return to work. I think that's probably our number one use case that we're receiving from our industrial clients is returning to work safely, returning to home safely, and then returning back to work yet, yet again because of the COVID crisis. So I think the answer to the question does reside, reside in the data, but it's the, the human process that's mirrored, you know, leveraging IoT related sensor data. Thanks. Great question though. Sometimes you just know it by looking at it, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. This has been a great presentation. Thank you for your time. Thank you, uh, Nazar. Okay, do we have some uh, other questions from the uh, audience or the panel? Um, 
Yes. <laughs> Azam is uh, opening his. Uh... Uh, uh, actually, um, if you allow, hi Jeff, uh, hi from Cairo. Um, uh, I think uh, uh, the application of uh, artificial intelligence in oil and gas the sector is uh, unlimited, as it is in in other uh, uh, application in all vertical industries all over the world. However, um, how do you, uh, do you think that, uh, uh, is it possible to, to transfer the know-how in such high-tech uh, domain to developing countries through uh, either the multinationals like um, uh, IBM or the companies working in the field of oil gas like ExxonMobil or Shell or whoever? Uh, or it will be only within the walls of uh, uh, the big companies and this is uh, couldn't be transferred under any circumstances under any label to uh, uh, to other uh, developing countries uh, uh, in in this regards how do you how do you see uh, such thing jeff so that's a very good question and we've we've witnessed it and we've seen this problem um i'm a big fan of teaching to fish so when, when it comes to knowledge transfer and making sure when we're consulting with companies, we don't want a dependency model. So we're always very big on making sure that what we've done with a client, we explain to the client what we've completed and that they're self-sufficient and independent. Um, I do believe, again, going back to some of the university partnerships that we've developed, that the university partnership in region for for customers in your region has got to be priority number one in partnership with IBM. So we've developed about eight or nine different university partnerships here in the United States that are focused on manufacturing and industrial market. We've grown that to the University of Birmingham overseas in the UK, and also most recently with King Saud in Saudi. So we're interested in expanding this because I do believe that although we've seen resources that have been working with us from our clients that have attended American universities, they always go back home. So we need to, I think, develop university partnerships like with Nile more effectively and have the ability to teach IBM technologies or other different te technologies in universities. So when students are coming out of these programs, they can, they can go to work day one and, and know exactly what they're doing. Um, we have a university AI related partnership where we provide universities with free curriculum, free software, and free mentoring. So if that's something that Nile University would like to leverage, we can definitely get you in front of the right people to have those discussions. But I do believe that although sometimes we see um, very talented PhD related resources around the world attending universities in the United States, they always go back to where their families are, where their companies are. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Uh, especially Egypt is, uh, is becoming an emerging uh, uh, global player in, uh, in the area of oil and gas after uh, the great discoveries that uh, uh, we had in Eastern Mediterranean and in the Western Desert in Egypt. So uh, this is, it will be a great initiative for IBM to establish ties with uh, Nile University having this uh, very specific uh, domain uh, uh, within the woods of uh, Nile University, uh, uh, I think uh, this would be a, a great initiative that we can work on together uh, as an outcome of uh, this uh, um, webinar uh, to then we can establish a path for the knowledge transfer on the ground. Excellent. I just made a note of that to follow up with you after this presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, we have a, a question from Ren Dani. Uh, would you please uh, be able to come in and to... Uh, I will get you the microphone on. Okay. Uh, Ren, you can uh, open up your microphone and address your question, please. Uh Uh, we can't hear you. Uh, I'm not sure why. 
Yes. Let's clear right now. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. I wanted to find out, uh, con considering that um, uh, this work on digitalization uh, originally emerged from the ICT, ICT space, uh, how do we then go about centralizing it uh, to the core of the organization as part of the core skills that organizations need to manage as part of their day-to-day uh, technology management, technology strategies, and aspects like that. How do we, how do we deal with that transitioning effort uh, to mainstream the skill set, so that they, they don't stay in the periphery and now actually core. Thank so, you. So, um, I, I do believe again it comes down to executive sponsorship. <clears throat> so. Nothing gets done unless you have an executive that sponsors an initiative, so that's important. I think second is, um, I'm a big fan of what I call site visits, where you have companies that are interested in learning from other companies in the same space, if they'll allow it, and sharing of best practices. Um, I'm also seeing a lot of uh, retired executives in industrial market that are becoming um, university-related liaisons, professors, or or instructors that are providing the best practices that they've learned in their careers to um, not only the university students, the university faculty, but also the clients that are partnered with those universities. But I do believe that any type of digital transformation has got to come from the top. It's not a bottom-up initiative. It's got to be an initiative that you would find in, in a company's annual report in the first or second paragraphs, for example. So I do believe that executive sponsorship is where you start. Second is learning from other companies in the space. And third is partnering with universities like Nile, again, to focus on the best practices and lessons learned from, from other clients that may have been in partnership. Uh, thank you. I, I, I have a quick question for Jeff. Jeff, based on your uh, observations in here uh, around the world, and it uh, seems that you have worked in uh, several places and uh, different countries uh, based on uh, the things that you've mentioned, uh, what, what, do you, what do you think the state of uh, digitalization is and where do you think it's going? I think in terms of industrial market, we're seeing what we want to see in some of our higher technology manufacturers. So if you okay. think of the Apples, you think of the Cisco's, you think of the Junipers, you think of our clients that are, that are in America that, I've, that I'm focused on, we're, we, we see that. I mean, it's, it's, they're, they're farther down, down the maturity path. Um, <clears throat> I do believe that we're gonna see either consistent delays or, or just flat out tabling of some of these initiatives due to budget so, you know, budget right now is really tight in automotive. It's very tight in aerospace and it's very tight in oil and gas in the U.S. right now. Mm. So we're starting to see a lot of initiatives that are getting pushed into 2021 until we come out of this pandemic. So I think we were already disadvantaged as an industrial market going into COVID. But I do believe that COVID will provide maybe another year or two of, of delays in this space. Um, it's unfortunate, but it just is what it is. Um, there, there are certain constraints that some of our auto clients and some of our global oil and gas clients just cannot focus on right now because they're, they're trying to retain their employees and keep the lights on. Yeah, but doesn't it seem that it's probably delaying it, but it's putting more pressure on it on the future? So, yes. it, so it, it has a, a negative effect on the short term, but it may have a much more positive effect on the longer term. Yeah, yeah, I, I would agree with that statement. Some of the projects that we, we've been asked to consult on are probably nine to 12 months out at this point in our industrial vertical. Mm -hmm. In our retail business, in our CPG business, in our distribution business, it's just the reverse. So it's um, we're starting to see more activity in, in different verticals that we manage. Mm -hmm. um, healthcare, I think, is another vertical that we're starting to see a lot of innovation in. Um, but I do believe that this still needs to be a priority, uh, whether it's on the front burner or the back burner, I think is the question. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we have a question from Linda. Uh, Linda, microphone is open. 
please. Hi, Linda. Hello. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, for me, I, I just want to find out um, the currently the, the oil and gas upstream business is struggling because of the the, the cost of the oil, uh, of, of rather the, the barrel of oil. And it is not really, um, I mean, most of the companies actually don't even want to to, to trail anymore because of the cost. And what I want to know, introducing AI, is it gonna bring any efficiencies? Um, what does it look like? And does it mean that then the cost of production can be optimized by, by, by bringing the AI technologies in? Yeah, so I think in terms of operational cost, artificial intelligence can bring a ton of efficiencies around just flat out data sharing, because a lot of the data that we're seeing from our oil and gas clients, again, exist in silos. So being able to search, retrieve, these are technologies that are readily available now that can help automate that process. We're looking at 30, 50, 60 years, maybe even more of information that is very, very difficult to search and retrieve. The other piece, um, for example, on a project that we did with Woodside in Australia, was around um, document management and knowledge sharing as well. They had um, retirees, people that left the company or resigned, people that moved on to different you know, roles within the company. All that data resided in their heads. So when, when they moved out, they physically moved out with that data. So being able to have a searchable, retrievable, consolidated, centralized data approach, I think will help with some of the overhead costs that really hit the bottom line from some of our oil and gas clients. Sure, just from a knowledge management point of view, that's very important. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. If we don't have any other questions, uh, then uh, we would like to uh, thank uh, Jeff for uh, wonderful uh, presentation and some insights into this whole issue. It seems that we still have a long way to go, actually. We're talking about the digital world. It's indeed a digital future, but still not yet a digital world. I mean, we are moving into a digital world. It seems like it. Uh, in the CX.0, uh, we talk about it, but uh, it uh, apparently is not practiced enough, uh, yet we are talking about Industry X.0, not uh, Industry 4.0, and uh, it, the companies that are going to be able to leverage uh, these technologies are the ones that are going to move ahead, the ones that are not leveraging uh, uh, these uh, technologies and advantages are just going to linger behind and uh, it seems to me the gap will continue to increase and uh, that's worrisome to a great extent for me so but uh, with that uh, thank you jeff i don't know uh, what else to uh, to conclude with other uh, from what you're talking about uh, we are still ways off from uh, realizing the total potential of uh, technologies that we have. And it seems that we still have a long way for people to understand the technologies, understand their uh, usages and their uh, leveraging them. So uh, thank you so much for uh, sharing uh, some of your thoughts with us and uh, uh, my greetings uh, to Ben Amaba and uh, to all the friends at uh, IBM. Will do. Thank you very much for having Thank me. You. Enjoy uh, the rest we, of your uh, week. Thank you, sir. We have one thing uh, that we usually do. We uh, can. Uh, we have a certificate of uh, appreciation uh, for you. Uh, thank you, thank Jeff, you. for the, being uh, part of uh, this conference. Mm -hmm. And uh, we always look forward to uh, working with you and uh, your colleagues uh, to advance the areas of digitalization in general across the, uh, the world. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I think Nezad likes to take a group picture group always. Photo, Can we take yes, a group please. So, uh, photo? Yeah. yeah. So I ask all uh, uh, people in the panel, uh, our uh, board members,
just to uh, switch on your camera to get this uh, final uh, photo with Jeff. Uh, Professor Mumaya, Joe, are you there? Uh, okay. <clears throat> David, thank you. David is there. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, okay. Leon, thank you very Leon much. Is there and Jeet is there. Okay. Uh, you okay. can go ahead. Gita, are you there? Okay, I will take more than one shot. So, okay, uh, okay no. smile. Okay, this one shot. <clears throat> Let's take another one. Okay. okay. One more. Huh? You still have to smile again? Yes, please. <laughs> Last one. Okay. Smile Last one. one more time. Right. Okay. One, two, three. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nizar. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you all. This concludes our session for the, this afternoon. And hopefully we'll see you tomorrow. Nizad, do you have announcements for tomorrow? I think yes, the uh, parallel session starts at 12. At we have 12? two afternoon uh, plenary sessions, uh, mm -hmm. one at 2 and one at 3.30. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, we will have uh, uh, the, the workshop from uh, uh, 2.30 uh, p.m. Uh, from 2 to, uh, from 2. From two, from two p.m. Yes, from yes, two p.m. Uh, till three uh, thirty. Uh, it will be a workshop addressing uh, uh, um, or covering some of the insights we came from uh, uh, discussions with Anton and addressing the issue of the technology definition. It will be a workshop, so it will be divided into groups, and then we'll do the session. The session will be announced and and, and broadcasted over Facebook as well. It will be quite interesting to see how to run uh, a workshop over uh, the social media right now. Uh, after this, we will have like 15 minutes break, and then we have the final uh, uh, panel discussion. Um, this panel discussion, we are really delighted to have. It talks about uh, technology and digital, uh, uh, the digital world, uh, and coming forward. Uh, we have multiple disciplines. Uh, we have the uh, um, speech about the uh, the new uh, norm of the uh, uh, workforce and the, the new jobs. Uh, by Mohammed Azam, we have the address of uh, the technology uh, uh, impacting the logistics business uh, by our distinguished speaker Basil Khalil from FedEx, and we have uh, a speech from uh, Dr. Rael Aqla from Nile University about uh, the new norm in education, and last but not least, uh, Professor Masoud Amin talking about the cybersecurity and energy and smart grids and how this will be impacting the digital arena right now. Uh, the session will be extended for one hour and a half. So to give our panelists the, the, uh, the, the room to address their thoughts and idea and to share uh, with you the questions and uh, the new thoughts. Afterward, after this session, we'll be moving to the closing ceremony um, of the IMO 2020 right now. There are some slight changes in the schedule. So please verify or check the online, uh, online schedule to adjust your calendar as well. Thank you very much for today. It was a real, real pleasure. Thank you, Jeff, for your insights. We really enjoyed your talk so much. And see you tomorrow at 12 with the parallel session. Thank you and have a nice time. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.